I have Shabbat. Please introduce. Please. I'm glad to introduce uh, Professor Twitter. We became friends somehow. I don't know through what. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was Wonderful. inevitable. <laughs> it's it's really it's a really real pleasure to talk to him to exchange ideas with him, and we're really privileged to have him uh, address us. Uh, actually, it was supposed to be mysticism, right? It was. It, it, it actually may be for many of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the amazing thing is that uh, David writes and speaks in philosophy in terms that they can understand and follow, which is, which is uh, I cannot say for everyone. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he'll go on with this trend, with this uh, understandable, accessible ideas uh, uh, in this lecture. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Professor, Professor Dr. Suriel Rashi, future Professor Suriel Rashi, will address us later about ethics. And uh, wonderful, we're all, we're all back here, we can start. So uh, it's a great honor to talk at this con conference. Uh, and I uh, want to express my uh, gratitude to Rev. Shavtai, uh, and uh, with whom I'm a friend for life. But I have been asking myself, Rev. Shavtai, why am I here? You know, why does he need philosophy? He needs more mysticism. And uh, so I, it came to me last night, okay? <laughs> you need the big story of philosophy's history via the semantic triangle. And now I know why I'm here, but I, let's see whether you agree. So uh, I'm going to argue very strongly with this set of slides uh, what perhaps you already know, but I want to reinforce that understanding. We have a crisis today in human reason. We ha Let me repeat that. We have a crisis today in human reason. We have a crisis in our conference here in human reason. We have no shared philosophy. I've heard appeals to, to uh, Wittgenstein. I've heard appeals to... Maimonides, I've, you know, but we have, n and, but I've heard arguments all over the place, uh, and uh, so we need principles. We need philosophical principles, and without that, we cannot make any progress. We're, we're, I, I would say, in the university. I'm, I want to make a strong argument, but my, my, that's not really the point of my slides. My slides are really to suggest why we are in a crisis that sometimes we're aware of, sometimes we're not aware of. My conclusion is that a university that puts religion at the center, a, a, a Jewish university, a Catholic university, a Lutheran university, must also put at the center a rational account of human experience that is open to religion. Indeed, that is complementary to religious understandings. And I'm speaking to, especially here to university presidents. This is not a new finding. This is old news, okay? But we need to rediscover and to encourage philosophical authorities. Philosophical authorities. That sounds like a contradiction in terms to us in the contemporary period. And I want to press very hard Maimonides as a philosophical authority. He's only been cited here as the source of the view that we have no idea uh, what God is. Of, of, of an agnostic point. And I, I want to insist that, yes, there are some agnostic points in, in Maimonides, but they are cultivated in the context of very serious classical philosophy that defends per se known propositions, self-evident truth. We hold these self truths to be self-evident. And I, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent of self-evident truth, as scandalous as that is, because that's just a terrible thing to say in a philosophy department. But we need to be able to say that. So, so I want to defend strongly Maimonides, Aquinas, if you want, John Duns Scotus, Avicenna. And, and so these are, the, these are the great heroes of our, of our uh, philosophical tradition who defended uh, religion. Uh, and and uh, they did so by uh, um, adopting, in a kind of continuous Greek tradition, inherited from uh, late imperial philosophy, uh, the ideas of Aristotle as they were cultivated uh, in a Platonic context. So this is Plato and Aristotle in a religious context. So, so I want to defend rationally known principles about the universe that must be accepted by all, per se known propositions. We need to be promoting this and hiring persons who can promote this in our universities. Philosoph 
philosophical authorities that can be appropriated in our contemporary context. So that's also very important, not people who just hide bound to the tradition. And so, so what I want to do is, is locate the classical thinkers in, the, in a contemporary context. And that's what I'm doing with the semantic triangle. If you don't know the story about language, then you don't know what's happened in philosophy in the 20th century, as I didn't know until I started teaching in our graduate program in Marquette. I took six courses, in, in, or eight courses, from my fellow philosophers. And I'm learning contemporary philosophy. It's so rich. So this is what we need to hire someone who's grounded in classical philosophy, but also can <coughs> update it in a contemporary context. Now, I'm giving language to the crisis that we're in. The language is, I got from uh, Professor Klima's work, who borrows the language from uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, of alternate conceptual schemes. What we don't realize when we use words like meaning, dogma, truth, notice these words that have been coming up. When I use the language of self-evident truths or principles, these, mean, these words all mean every philosophical term. And, and our language is filled with philo Greek philosophical terms. Every term means something different in a different conceptual scheme. We need to be sensitive to, to that. Otherwise, we're just talking past each other all the time. When we talk past each other, we're promoting agnosticism. We're promoting skepticism. We need philosophical clarity. How, how are we going to get that? OK. So I'm using, I'm using the language of, of conceptual schemes, but I want to point before we start at a, to, to a sign of the crisis, which should be evident, but you, you may, not, may not be aware of it, but should be evident if we look back on each of our philosophical uh, training. All of us in this room have had philosophical training, and we don't realize it because we've, we've since third grade, or you know, for me it was sixth grade, but younger people, third grade, we're immersed in a discourse that puts science at its center. And that comes built in with, a certain, with certain philosophical presuppositions, of which science uh, teaching is not aware. And, and, uh, but but I want to make that, uh, I want to make it remind us uh, of, of those presuppositions. There's a, there's a conceptual scheme in which, and a philosophy in which the, the uh, science is taught. And, and I think it fits very well, not religious thought, as evidence from that statistic that, 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 <laughs> that the most serious scientists tend to be atheists, 60%. It, it fits better uh, uh, modern philosophy, which are, are, are certain strands of modern philosophy, which culminate in scientism. In fact, I think Descartes is already promoting a kind of scientism. But uh, all right. So, so it, do you need a definition of scientism? Science alone is a source of truth. So a certain method, which only we, that is the, the latest uh, uh, learners of science teaching and the most recent scientists, only we know. And everything else that came before is stupid, as we all know. No. All right? If you take that view, you're going, to be, you're going to have philosophical trouble. You're not going to be able to defend religion in the university. OK. So what, what, is, the, what is the problem? Okay, so we need to understand the big story of philosophy. I'm going to talk about the semantic triangle. Now, here's just a slide, and I could click through all of this, but I, I'm reminding you of what, you know, everyone knows some figure here, you know, is it Descartes would be typical. Many of our universities in North America begin, philosophy begins with Descartes, you know. And, uh, but Descartes in the middle. This is modern philosophy. It's a technical term, uh, 17th to 19th century philosophy. Uh, Descartes to Kant, so I will remind you of some of those figures. But notice it precedes it, and Descartes builds on ideas from the medieval and ancient philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, the medievals. What you may not be as aware of as well is contemporary philosophy. And I'm going to focus here not on phenomenology and existentialism, but on analytic philosophy, the style of philosophy that's uh, prevalent in Anglo-American circles, also in Germany, and, and increasingly in... in, in uh, in, in, uh, on the continent, but, but it begins with Frege. So, so Frege is very, very important in my, in my story. I, to talk about the history of philosophy, I think the best way to put everybody on the map is to use a semantic triangle, that, and I'll explain that. But unless you give an account of language, as I said at the beginning, you're not understanding what's happened in philosophy in the last uh, 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 125 years, or 150 years. And the semantic triangle allows you to put language in, in, in the picture. 
Okay, so what is the meaning triangle? There's a good word that, that <laughs> we need to worry about what that means. But uh, instead of trying for a definition, I'm going to just remind you that the Greek word semine is the word to uh, be a sign of or to mean. Uh, so this is semantics. Notice that's an interesting word. If you're just talking about semantics, all the universal presence will leave, right? Immediately, because you're just, this is just logic, word puzzles. You're just, this is, has no practical value. That's the way we use the word. But, but meaning is an important word, as, we've saw, as we saw in the last session, right? So this is the meaning triangle. And what, what, what I mean by a triangle is there are three vertices. So the triangle represents the mutual relationship between the world as one of the uh, vertices, the mind, and language. So there's the world, and there's Aristotle there as I teach my students, and he says the word triangle because he sees in the pizza and in the cone and the Eiffel Tower something common. We'll be working on that. But this idea of the semantic triangle, it's really, a, I think, as far as I know, 20th century vocabulary for something that Aristotle articula articulated in one of his books of logic. That is, we could read spoken words or symbols or signs of what is undergone, pathemata, in the soul, which are likenesses of things in reality. So there you have on my slide. And by the way, don't take notes because I, I'll, I'll be happy to give you my slides. It's, you know, it costs you a lot of money, of course, but if you email me. So there's Aristotle's Greek, and we don't have time to read. Very poor Loeb tra translation. Okay. So the, on the classical paradigm, and I really want to hit this because, because we tend to think that, that here, here's my, my, my bugaboo. Uh, we tend to think, and I tend to think of, the, before Descartes, the, the, the classical picture was that there's these objects out there that are third person, they have a complete understanding, they have no, there's no understanding of a relationship to a mind. And I want to suggest, this is completely false, it's, but it's just that the classical thinkers didn't articulate a language in which they accounted for the mind-world <coughs> relationship. So I want to suggest, that's in a, in a global way what I'm trying to suggest with this account of the classical paradigm. And I emphasize the word paradigm for those who are more technical. So this, I'm here in the triangle, I'm not talking about, we, of course we have language for our mental thoughts, and we have language for language, you know, but the, you know, paradigmatically we're going to, we, our sentences are about the world, you know, <laughs> about the pizza. And, and the classical paradigm I'm following Aristotle's model, I think, as the, as the best. Uh, uh, but Plato's behind the scenes, of course. We can go into that. But, but you know, there's, there are things in the world, and they come in, they're, they're undergone by the mind. And we have a third thing, which is the, the, the same thing, but the form of the thing in the mind. The, the word form is very important. Notice that's a word that is not inherited. It's true, we have form and con form and content, so form and matter in a paper, structure, you know, form, but, but we've lost form. And, and Professor Klima's new book is very well titled, it's Beyond Form. What happens after. after form, better, after, <laughs> after form. What happens in a world where you get rid of form? That's the whole point of my slides. What happens in a world? That's our world. There's no form, okay? So the world comes into the mind and we express it in language. And of course, in turn, we can complete the triangle by using language to describe the world. Notice here in this picture, the content sameness, which you can see in my vision, you can kind of see visually the same pizza and cone <coughs> in principle. Of course, if there's fog, if you're blind, you know, so your senses, as the ancients knew, it's not like they, it's true, they think colors are real. And, but you're in trouble if you don't think colors are real, as science teaches us. Colors are only things in the mind. Oh yeah, light waves are real, and sound waves are real, but there's no sound. Sound's only inside out. You're in big trouble, as you'll, as you'll see. Okay? But that's our science, scientific philosophy. For Aristotle, the, okay, you see the semantic triangle. I want to emphasize the content sameness. Colors in the world are also in our visual images. Questions? So notice the word logos. I put this, I think this is very, very helpful. Logos is, is Viktor Frankl's word for meaning. So the, in the ancient conception, they didn't, only the Stoics really spelled it out quite in this way, but the Stoics are kind of a popular version, that's interesting, of, of Aristotle and Plato. So, but the Stoics, 
really express this, but all the thinkers who are not skeptics, skepticism is part of ancient philosophy too, let's not forget that, but, but I'm not, they're not the paradigmatic <coughs> thinkers that support religion, right? So, so uh, they saw logos, matna, meaning, Hebrew word, you know, so I don't have it on my slide. So, you know, in all three vertices, so that mind, world, and language were connected. The, the three branches of philosophy tell a unified story. Metaphysics is an account of the logos that's in the world. Epistemology is, a, is, is an account of the logos, the meaning that's in, our, in us when we think about the world. And logic is an account of language, which is about our mind and the world. So notice how they fit in the semantic triangle. By contrast, we have tremendous difficulty of talking about meaning outside language. You know, definitions, again, definitions is a philosophical word that, that, that means something different in, 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 under different conceptual schemes. For us, a definition is, is, a, is a set of other words in a dictionary. This is Occam's understanding of a definition, but this is a very curious, it doesn't fit at all the classical, classical picture. What is meaning? We, you know, we, we are, we're going to have a lot of trouble. Well, that's because of our semantic triangle. Watch, watch what happens to the semantic triangle under, under our, our contemporary discourse. We inherit this dif discourse from, this difficulty from modern philosophy. You can see this in our philosophy departments. All philosophy begins with Descartes. Just say no to the history of philosophy. You know, actually we say all philosophy, take the science model, begins with, you know, the latest uh, scholarship in, you know, Harvard and Princeton and Yale in, in the last 10 years. That's philosophy. Just say no to the history of, but what happened to this, the classical semantic triangle? You might ask. You might not, but I'm, we're going to ask. Alistair McIntyre, uh, you know, notice uh, Professor Klima's new book, after, after Form is named after the book After Virtue, you know. And the chapter one is very, the book is difficult, but, uh, but I recommend strongly chapter one if you haven't read it. You know, uh, he follows the uh, 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 account of the ca canticle for Leibowitz in which you know, they're rediscovering after a nuclear holocaust, you know, the shards. So they, they come up with little fragments of text, you know. In the beginning was to be is better than not to be, that's the, et cetera. And they just have these shards trying to put, put together fragments of, you know. Well, McIntyre says that's what happened after the total storm or nuclear holocaust of modern philosophy. Okay. And he's talking about ethics. All the ethic, every word, virtue, every after virtue, every word in, in English for ethics has been changed after the Holocaust of modern philosophy. We no longer so anytime we use language, you got to be careful of what conceptual scheme we're we're, we're using in which that la that language makes sense. Okay, so we could read that. What we possess are the fragments of a conceptual scheme, parts of which now lack those contexts from which their original significance derived. So the, we're, you know, if we don't know that original significance, we're, we're not using the, the word the way it was originally intended. So what is, the, what is the Holocaust? There are two major explosions you should consider. And the impact of those explosions were not immediately, fe immediately felt. The first one is Occam's nominalism. So what is nominalism? It's in terms of metaphysics, so you notice that's one, one vertex, it's a denial that there's any intelligibility in the world, anything that the mind maps onto, we could say, which the classical vocabulary, the most perfect resulting vocabulary is the language of Avicenna. It's the language of Alexander of Aphrodisias. It's, it's, it is, in a way, the language of Aristotle and Plato. But essences, essences, that's a scandalous term, essentialism in contemporary thought, scandalous if you're, you notice in post-colonialism, it's just if you're an essentialist, that's the worst thing, which is very strange. You say, well, there's no such thing as human nature. So there's no such thing that makes us all equal. But they think essence is just anything that you, like, like, being, a, like being a white person. That's an essence of being a black person. But the thing is, they need to talk about black persons. They say, well, let's try it. Let's pretend as if there are essences. We know, even know essentialism is absolutely terrible. So it's just, it's just all confused. You know, that never was. And essence has had nothing to do with, you know, accidents. <laughs> you know? You know, the way a person lives is an accident. Essence is what, you're, what is it that's in your definition according to the substance that you are. In the first instance, we can talk about the essence of a color or something, but it's, as Avicenna says, essence is what a definition is about. So we need definitions, but this is, you know, this is, 
the title of my of my the mistitle of my talk, but I, mean, I am defending <laughs> the essences and for Avicenna are what definite and for uh, Alexander of Aphrodisius, the greatest commentary on Aristotle, two, uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, flourishes two thirty uh, C.E. Uh, he, he's already making this distinction between <coughs> between what's in the mind and what's in reality, and what's in in the mind is essence, it's intelligibility. Occam gets rid of it. There's no intelligibility, there's no logos that fits the mind. But there's no logos in the mind either for a nominalist. Universals are just words. There's no essences in the mind. Essence is just a word. That's our essence. Just think of what essence is, in si or definition in science, or all your science books. It's just a description. It's just language for you know, what we can measure, or what we can supposedly have empirical experience. But then we don't ask, what is empirical experience? That's a disaster, but anyway. John Burdan, look at the dates, 1330 to 1360. Perhaps the greatest nominalist thinker who ever lived, if you follow one authority, already raises the problem of demon skepticism. How do we know that the ideas in our mind are not actually caused, not by the world, because how do we know? There's no intelligibility out there. They could just be put in our mind by God or by an evil genius. Sound familiar? That's the foundation, I mean, in, according to my big story, of modern philosophy. Now, you might have heard of Jula Klima, a Hungarian professor of language at, at, at Fordham University, that in my first year undergrads need to know about his work. He's the most important philosopher. I say he's the greatest philosopher of our time. But it's, he's the most, if you don't want hyperbole, <laughs> he, 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 but I think you should know that. He's the, he is the one that you should be looking to as, as where to go for the authorities that we need in a religious university. I think it's so providential, it's, it's almost miraculous that he's here. I didn't invite him, I didn't suggest him to you, so what? How did he, you know, and you thank me for his, I don't know why I'm here, but you know, I, it, I mean, but you must know his work. It's quite technical, but he also has popular work, yes. Um, Did I make a mistake? You know, no, 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 no. But, you know, don't listen to him. He doesn't know everything. You know, I, I'm, I'm the. You are absolutely right about my evaluation. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, just a little observation about uh, our uh, local youth. Did you notice? Uh, did, did anyone notice here that the world that uh, we are supposed to be fixing here is inscribed in Hungarian? No. no. It says Burish Tenge, Red Sea. Mm. This is a this is this is a globe that happens to be inscribed in Hungarian. <laughs> there you go. I just noticed this, this morning. I'm sorry. So talk about coincidences. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Proves your point. So <laughs> supporting evidence. Prior to Occam, prior to Occam. There is no knowledge of the world without content sameness. That's taken for granted. But now this is, this is going to be exploded, you see. So, so, so we didn't, uh, there's no identification of the semantic triangle. This is, this is a contemporary identification, right? But, but there, it's, it, it's just understood that the world is intelligible. I think we, even we think the world is intelligible. We might say that. But that, that translates into science alone knows what it is, right? And you'll see what happens to that by contemporary philosopher, at least in the contemporary analytic tradition, what that was going to mean. There's no such thing as human beings. In particle physics, there's no human beings, so therefore, there's no such thing as human beings. There's no such thing as anything anybody talks about in any language, except formal logic. And uh, describing ultimate forces of physics. That's all there is. Everything else is just language. That's the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, as stated by a Brit. He's from Ohio. His name is Willard Van Orman Quine. He's in my slides, so you'll get, we'll get to Quine. You never ever, have you ever heard of Quine? No. Yeah. You know, vaguely, you know, he has his, <laughs> maybe in math, you know. No. But, but, you know, I think realistically he's the most influential philosopher on our, on our culture today. Realistically. It's, by the way, it's just David Hume updated, in, in the, but anyway. Uh, all right. Second big explosion, Galileo. People don't realize this. <laughs> the real revolution is not the Copernicus. This is, this is kid stuff. The real revolution 
is the denial, and notice Descartes's aware of this, and, and the skepticism's already there, he's reacting to that, he's a great anti-skeptic, Descartes, but the denial that heat is in the, heat is only in us, right? Or it's just the measurable <laughs> motion of particles, which is what we learn when we learn science, right? But that's true of all the qualities. Colors are not out there, there's no colored object. The sound is not out there, there's no sound. Oh, sound waves, yeah. But this is just stimulus response mechanism, but I'm just a sensing machine, eventually I'm just a computer, right? But, but, but it starts with Galileo, this is, a, this is a nuclear holocaust. Why not in Lucretius? Yeah, yeah, you can see, but it's not programmatic. Well, and why it, is it, David, why is it different from Aristotle's theorem of identity? Sounding and hearing are an identity, and there's no sounding if there's no hearing. There's no teaching if there's no learning. There's no heating if there's no, you gotta have a source and a, and a patient. So, I don't understand the question. In other words, are you saying that uh, Galileo and Descartes are just following Aristotle? Well, I'm asking you to explain how your characterization of this Galilean point differs from Aristotle's. Okay, so what I'm saying is, that all of the things of our senses are not in reality. See, I'm trying to X them out and kind of leave them so you can see them there. Well, so so them. Descartes' question is, well then, if you can't trust your senses at all, if the senses don't t tell you what's out there, how do you know there's anything out there? Where's my question mark? Can I? Where's my question mark? <laughs> no, I said, oh, wrong computer. How do you know there's a world out there, you see? You're not, you're not, you're not using the world, anything from out there, to get at it. It's, I think, therefore I am. There is a perfect, there is a, there is a, uh, a perfect mind who is completely good, who, who wouldn't deceive me. And therefore, whatever, whatever ideas I have in my mind that has absolutely no perceptual content, mathematical ideas, metaphysical ideas, only those, I, they have to conform exactly to the world. Otherwise, God's an evil genius, the whole thing falls apart, which of course is Nietzsche. I mean, you know, I mean, I, it's going to fall apart, right? That's really a, a, a wacko view in the end. Uh, but, but I mean, so, so you see the previous slide, I'm saying there's no intelligibility out there. There's no, that's Occam. There's nothing intelligible out there. There's, now, of course Occam thinks there's things that are intelligible to God, but there's nothing that fits our human mind. So our human universals, actually universals are not even in our mind, they're just language. Uh, Professor Klima can qualify things, but, but you know, that's the first explosion. The second one, colors, sounds, they're not out there. So we just got these independent, notice here's, we've been talking about this in the last session over, and Buber's actually challenging that, right? We have this independent eye that we just have to discover. I mean, there's a lot in that, in that psychological, cr criminological analysis I want to own, but this is a Cartesian self that's just an inner, immaterial, ultimately, thing that, that, that uh, discover, can prove the existence of the world out of pure ideas without any sense perception. We could, we could eventually get rid of bodies altogether, as is going to happen with our next, next great philosopher on my slides. But, but Questions? We, but We've we got to keep moving. We don't have too much time. What? Hmm? Yeah. But we still agree on colors, of course. In what sense? So it's interesting, even the, the skeptics in the ancient world, there were skepticism in the ancient world, I still have, I still have color consciousness. Do you, raise your hand if you think there's color consciousness that you have. You see colors. So, but the great, the, the most interesting. Not, it's not very interesting, but, but the the, the, the the most observed philosophy, which is very compelling in contemporary philosophy, is there's no such thing as pain. There's no such thing as color experiences. Mm -hmm. That's just language that we use. We're just machines that are stimulus response mechanisms. And we, you know, it's beha completely behavior, steam, machine behavior. There's no such thing as colors at all. Which, you know, uh, I mean, well, I'm going to motivate the contemporary discussion with another set of nuclear explosions. But, but, um, but I'm just trying to say, Descartes and like the ancient skeptics are not denying like eliminativists. There's different versions, of course, you know, radical and less extreme, but. Uh, 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 eliminating what we now call, notice it's a highly technical word, we got to use Latin for that, qualia. In other words, Aristotle's qualities. I mean, you know, but Galileo puts them only in the mind. Descartes, they're ne he's never going to come back and say there's any qualities here. They're not, you can't perceive the world with your senses for Descartes. 
It's a mistake. It's anti-empiricism. That's what it means to be a rationalist. You trust reason alone. It's really an extreme view. Again, these are caricatures. We can qualify. I mean, nobody can live this way, right? It's absurd to live it, but, but this is, this is the, the, this, the, the philosophy, and you can see the motivation. He's solving a problem of Galileo. He's a great philosopher. It's a great idea. I mean, it's very, very clever. So here's the Cartesian method. We, but I think what's important here is just to see the arrow. You know, there's no logos here, and by logos is very broad. I'm including, you know, uh, uh, perceptible forms. You know, that comes into the mind. Rather, we're starting with ideas of mind, proving perhaps, with the help of God, perfect being, the existence of the world. What if that project fails? Now, I think Barclay is very interesting here. Notice he is a religious think. Excuse me, he is a religious thinker. But in the name of defend, and in the name of defending reason against skepticism, he gets rid of a physical world. All that exists are minds and ideas in our minds. God puts all of our clear and distinct ideas are now perceptible ideas that God puts in all our minds. We all see the table right now because God puts that. A perfect being puts these ideas so we can communicate. Notice he doesn't put in your mind the idea of the pink elephant that I see right here. What color pink is it? You know, We all see it slightly differently. He doesn't put that idea. We make that idea, but we don't make the idea. Of, but God puts the idea there. Okay, it's absurd. But notice what I want to point out is the semantic line. That's a very interesting concept. I and mean, again, you could say, well, yeah, but Twetton, I mean, you're, you know, you're kind of prejudiced, you know, because, you know, your triangle has world, mind, language. Yeah, but I mean, this, I mean, you know, you, we want those three things, don't we? You know, and so, but Barclay's giving up all together on the world in order to get God in the picture. That's really big philosophical trouble. To defend the world by giving up, excuse me, defend God by giving up on the existence of the world. Look, I mean, I really think it's true that, you know, we have a crisis, and why should I accept this proposition, not that? Because there's one world from which we get our meanings. Yeah, it's under God, but it's not just like God's creating these, I mean, because God can create different meanings in different minds. Would a Martian think this way about the world? I mean, Kant asks, you know, so, but, uh, you know, we have one world, at least the world that we know, and that gives us unity. If you give up on that, you've got a real problem of unity of discourse. Kant, we can go over Kant, but Kant remain, continues to be, human Kant continues to be extremely influential. Not so much Barclay, because what Hume, of course, is doing is getting rid of the mind. We don't have a mind, just a collection of ideas. You know, so it's almost like you end up with a semantic point. You know, but, uh, but I don't want to ascribe that to, to Hume. But Kant remains influential in our contemporary discussions. Uh, for Kant, it's interesting for Kant, there, there's, we are, he actually thinks there's something out there. It's really quite incredible because Hume doesn't know there's anything out there. It's just a collection of ideas. But, but Kant thinks there's a world out there from which we're getting these, bomb, we're being bombarded with these points of light and sound that we organize. All the intelligibility is a projection of the human mind. Unfortunately, we all do it exactly the same way, right? No, you know, because we have non-Euclidean geometry, uh, non-Newtonian physics, and non-Aristotelian logic. All the inventions, discoveries, brilliant, of German philosophers refuting Kant. You know? So Kant's story works because all our minds are built exactly, this, therefore we stretch out space, we, can, we impose space onto the dots so that we can end time, and since we all do it in the same way, we're not from Mars, Oh wait, men are from Mars and women from Venus. Okay, but we all do it the same, exactly the same way, therefore we have science. That's Kant's picture. Now, what you don't perhaps know though, is the importance of Frege's, I think, really valuable revolution, which, which is anti-idealism. If I had more time, I'd show you some quotations from Galileo on the one hand, denying that sense qualities have any reality. And by the way, in the same, same handout I give to my first year students, Galileo denying their essences in science. There's no definitions in science, no, no philosophy in science, right? No definitions of human beings, it's a description. What is life is just a description of functions, behaviors. 
So, so that's, that, that attitude to science is also in Galileo, the anti-essentialism. Frege is bringing back reality in a certain way, but in a very curious way. He starts with language, the perfect language of mathematical logic. So here's a Fregean sentence. Now, I have an English sentence, and then I have just two symbols. I can't go into it, you know, for any x. If x is f, then x is g. It's the foundation for computer science, if you've studied it. Uh, but, you know, he's translating uh, things that have conceptual content, as he puts it. They hook up, so that would be your triangle word, to a higher realm, he calls it, uh, a dritte Reich. A, high, a third realm, uh, uh, and, and then you have your, your small letters which hook up to particular things in the world. The Eiffel Tower, this particular pizza or cone, is a triangle. So the Eiffel Tower is a triangle, is a Fragian proposition, but he, he, he's separating out the, the universal content, the platonic part, from the individual content that's naming individual things in the world. And, 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 and the, the foundation, the ground for both is real. For Frege, universals are real. He's a Platonist about universals, as is Bertrand Russell, as is G.E. Moore, the founders of Anglo-American philosophy. 95% of philosophy in the, in the English-speaking world is Anglo-American. It began with Frege and, and Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore. They're all realists about, you know, they're Platonists, anti-idealists. You do not just try to start in your mind, there's some beautiful quotations in Frege. I mean, I think this is very great, very helpful, actually, because he's restoring reality, Pl Platonism, and then he's restoring reality, the Eiffel Tower and the Cone. And he, for Frege, Frege thinks colors are real. Frege's not really a philosopher, but, I mean, he's a, he's a thinker, he's a great thinker, he's a great, I want to say he's a great philosopher, but he, he's not really trying to give a philosophical, he's trying to develop a mathematical logic to solve math problems, but he takes colors to be real. When you describe the colors of a strawberry, you're not describing your strawberry color experiences, something in you, so that I'd have to get sight in your, your head and in my head to, com is to compare each other. Are we talking about the same red strawberries? No, there, there's red strawberries out there, says Frank. The colors are real, and universals are real. You get the realism? We're not talking, we're not describing our, in our subjective contents. That's modern philosophy. This is very anti-modern. Have you heard that before? Postmodern, anti Descartes, anti Kant. He's, he's rejecting that. This becomes very popular. All the, all the founders of Anglo American philosophy are previous Hegelians, British Hegelians. They're, they're monists. They're like Spinoza. They're like Hegel. They, they don't, I mean, I don't know what Hegel himself holds, but for the British Hegelians, there's no, we're all part of one emerging absolute, which is conscious and also a world. And, you know, but they're, they're, Frege is an anti-idealist. Russell and Moore are anti Wittgenstein is an anti-idealist. He thinks universals are not real. He's an anti-Platonist, but, but oh, that's okay. I mean, we can, we can understand that. So there's a linguistic story behind contemporary analytic philosophy that people need to, to be aware of, but its, its motivation has to do with mathematics. It's, a, it's logically brilliant. It's, so, but I would say logic is a human, is a human art and there are different kinds of logic. They have different purposes. This is the best logic I've, I mean, I've widely accepted for math. But do you want your mathematicians telling you what's real? You know? So that seems to be what we found very compelling in the 20th century. But you'll see what happens. So what I want to suggest here with the yellow remarks is the result of this approach brackets, I'm using Husserl's language, brackets the mind. Now, Frege talks about a mind, of course, but you don't really need a mind in this picture. What you need is language. The perfect language hooks up, to use the language of, you know, sort of popular philosophy of language, hooks up directly to universals that are real, platonic, and to individual things in the world. But, of course, that's just inviting criticism. But first, I want to suggest to you what's going to happen is a semantic line. Notice it's not a mind-language semantic line, as in Berkeley, but it's a language-world semantic line. This is the model, the paradigm, I think, of contemporary analytic philosophy. The most extreme view is there's no world, it's just everything is just language. And you can see that it's not really fair, you know, in some of the late remarks of Wittgenstein, but, but I think... Um, it's not fair. I, I didn't, I, but you can see that 
you know, you can see you, you can see the inclination to, to describe things only in terms of language games, etc. And okay. But I, I want to focus on Quine. Quine's nominalism, you remember what nominalism is? Universals are nothing but words. There's no conceptual content in reality. Right? So I didn't quite get my triangle completely erased there, but you can see the idea. We don't like a higher realm. Raise your hand if you're a Platonist. About 25% of analytic philosophers, or certainly 25% of metaphysicians in analytic philosophy are Platonists. And I think maybe 50% of mathematicians are, you know, 35 are Platonists. But we don't like Plato. Well, who likes Plato? I mean, raise your hand. I, I, I want to go with Aristotle on this, say that universals are in the mind. So Quine is sort of following Frege's account of language, of course, as you know. Universals are just words. He's erasing that third realm. There's no essences or natures in reality. Everything in reality is through and through particular. This is Occam. This is Quine. There are no essences out there. This is an invitation to, to Kripke, by the way, to disagree. But we call this, I think, the better view. Again, this is, this is a simplification of Quine. Quine has several different periods. This is a practical, pragmatic uh, account. You can favor phenomenal experience, say everything is just phenomenon in your mind. But the later Quine does, t does t tend to favor the scientific picture, which is a realistic picture. There is actually something out there that our propositions tack onto. Uh, it's it's in, in a form of empiricism, but, but there's something out there that the, the E tacks onto, but it has no intelligible content. It's just a blob. So we call this in metaphysics blob theory. You know, Quine in, in this scientific worldview, we call it scientific realism, is, is a blob theorist. So there's just these, these blobs out there that our language tacks onto. And of course, there's blobs here too. There's no such thing. Quine's very famous for this. Human beings are just myths. So somebody famously said, well, you know, who's Quine writing and selling his books? You know, a prof professor at Harvard, the most important. <laughs> You know, he, you know, he's, but Quine points out, and again, this is kind of the evolutionary account, the scientistic account, scientism. You know, it would take so long to describe the truth, which is there's no such thing as anything we describe in human language. So you would have to use symbolic logic to describe one particle. You have to trace it to the Big Bang because everything is connected to everything. That proposition, which is the only true statement about that particle, would take so long the universe would be over by the time you expressed it. So for shorthand, oh yeah, we have to say there's a human being. Oh yeah, we say there's a God. We say there's all these things. That's fine. But of course we know the ultimate particle physics, we're still 300 years from finishing it all. Once we finish it all, then we, 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 maybe we could eliminate all these things of folk vocabulary, like there's a self, like there's, there's a table. We could eliminate all the qualia and have more of a science language. You know, this, this, this neuron at, at, at sector... Uh, V5 in, in coordinate uh, 42nd longitude, et cetera, et cetera, is being stimulated by this. This would be, our, this would be the, uh, um, the uh, translation of the statement, I'm in pain, you know. Uh, that would be better, uh, more, more accurate to reality, although still false, uh, still a false, uh, not false, hang on, I misspoke, but still a kind of uh, evolutionary uh, need to shorthand of the truth, the scientific, the ultimate particle physics truth. Uh, uh, I can't finish my sentence. You see, I'm on a tirade by now. Okay, so the last chapter. Are we almost out of time? So last chapter of all analytic, all accounts of contemporary analytic philosophy. <clears throat> it's quite interesting, I think, to see that. After this chapter, we break up into fields, and now there's a lot less commitment to, to work in these fields because there's no big story that's grabbed our attention beyond Quine. But if there is a big story, it's that of Saul Kripke. <laughs> Quine's from Ohio, I'm from Milwaukee, but Kripke is from Omaha, and you have Princeton farting, fighting against Harvard. Notice Oxford and, and Cambridge have dropped out. It was a Cambridge professor who said, I didn't write down the name, Quine is the most important philosopher of the 20th century. But, you know, all, all, the, all the stories end, end with Kripke. And what's Kripke? He's an anti-Quine. I mean, I can give you lots of cool examples, but, but you don't have to read this slide, but I just want to get you, you know, he's bringing back, not really Aristotle, there's no metaphysics in, 
uh, that would resemble anything like the classical account, but, but he's bringing back essences. That is, uh, water is H2O in all possible worlds. Water is a, is a proper name of a kind. It names that kind of thing as described by chemistry, it's true, it's very Aristotelian the, to, to put chemistry at the center, I think, the elements, you know. Um, but essences, essences are the same in all possible worlds. If you call water, if you call water a frog, if you call that water, well, that's, that's a misuse of language. Water is a proper name for this kind. Human is a proper name for this kind. Those kinds, it's, we call it semantic essentialism, you know, linguistic essentialism, but, but nonetheless, he's committed to to, uh, to, to something that our definitions are about. He doesn't have a very uh, sophisticated account of what the ontological metaphysical status of that, those essences are, but you see what I'm trying to suggest is we need to go back to Aristotle. It's very interesting. I like to get your, those who are working contemporary philosophy, but I hear it more and more. I have a colleague who who's, who's follows Quine, as, as a majority do, and uh, is very, very skeptical, but he's more, in, more and more interested in Aristotle. Because Aristotle can be conceived as a materialist. There's a certain orthodoxy in contemporary analytic philosophy. You must be against free will. It's absolutely absurd to say that particles have, you know, we have a science, scientific account of reality. It's materialist and it's determinist. Those are, those are taken for granted. But maybe we can make Aristotle into a determinist and a materialist and that we could bring this back because it's a sophisticated picture. And, I mean, as I say, Kripke is the last chapter if you want to go for something other than Quine. And it's kind of a back to Aristotle. So I'm kind of asking myself, was classical theorizing all so bad? I want to ask the people in this room, you know, but we're just allergic to metaphysics. I mean, we just, in my department, we just laugh. I mean, you're talking about poetry or what are you talking You know, a, 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 like a, 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 an account that describes the world and says, you know, there really is a table here. That's just considered to be it laughable. Well, I don't know what's that. What is, who knows what the word metaphysics means? Because it should mean something different if my thesis is correct. You know, if you take, a, if you take the, uh, the uh, uh, conceptual scheme of contemporary analytic philosophy, metaphysics means one thing. If you take the conceptual scheme of modern, it means something else. You can, so what are we talking about when we use these words? I, I, I shouldn't be critical, but but we just laugh it out of, out of the room for the most part, but it's coming back, I think. Although we're, it'll take us a while in Milwaukee to catch up with, with, uh, with the, the return to Aristotle in philosophy of mind, at least is my understanding, but I, I'm not really an expert. So here's a little bit the Aristotelian picture, which I want to recommend at least to the university presidents and potential presidents in this room, which is moderate realism, you know, that the world is intelligible. And what we, would, what we would say if we follow this tradition, and I want to defend philosophical authorities. I mean, you don't have time for all this. You don't have time to figure, we don't, who figures all this out? This is a, I mean, and I'm going to get criticisms. You know, everybody in the room can criticize my presentation. I've got to get holes all over. I've got an hour to teach you the whole history of philosophy. But, but, but what I want to suggest is, you know, this model is not so bad. It's, it's, in, it's, it's, to use Frege's language, conceptual content <coughs> in the world. I want to take it out of the Platonic realm and put it in things. That was the whole point of Avicenna. It's the best account of universals ever given, <coughs> followed by uh, uh, Maimonides. It's followed by Aquinas and Duns Scotus. It was rejected, of course, as we saw by Occam. But it's a, it's a prevailing account in, in, uh, in, in philosophical thought that is uh, complementary to, to, to monotheism. Uh, it's out there, you know, but we need to rediscover it for ourselves. So it's you got the you got the triangles. Intelligibility is in there, the matna, uh, the mani, and they and they they come into the mind. And universals uh, are not in reality. The triangle itself, it's in the mind. And when the mind reflects on the essence in relation to the individuals that have that essence, it sees a one over the many. Universal is a kind of one over the many which is a property of, of, of the, the thoughts in our mind. That's the Aristotelian picture, and I think that's complementary with the last of the, of the great uh, syntheses in contemporary analytic philosophy. Every history ends with Kripke, and the story's over because, why? Because there's nothing else to say without going back. 
I mean, you know, we've really tried, and if you look, and, and I, I would say this, that if you look at the history of philosophy, although the, the history of philosophy is the history of disagreement, and, you know, Boethius' uh, model in Lady, Lady Philosophy and in, in the Consolation of Philosophy, the, the second most work uh, copied by hand in the Middle Ages was Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy. Lady Philosophy appears to him, he's dying, he's going to be killed by the emperor. He, he, she's in rags because we've been, you know, I mean, just it, it defeats itself. Every position defeats itself. There's no unity. We need philosophical authorities. <coughs> You know, but but I think it's not it's not bad. You know, to say there's intelligibility for conceptual content in the world, and it fits with a certain account of contemporary analytic philosophy. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. David. So I'm going to raise the, ask the first question ahead. since you're yep. speaking to the four of us who are. Uh, university presidents at Catholic universities, and I, I, I am you flattered. A philosopher. <laughs> no, I'm flattered that you think we can solve this problem. I didn't say that. <laughs> wait, 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 what? Did, what was my thesis? No, no, no. That we need. No, no, hang on. That we need philosophical authorities right. in our in and but our our, but but our as we reconceive the uh, the religious university as we yeah. try to we need to be sensitive to these issues as we as we hire. Because we need people who are aware of the problems and are, have, can defend philosophical principles. We and, need philosophical and principles. And I agree with you. But I, and I'm going to draw an analogy. <laughs> I, you know, I come from Texas, and and I'm going to draw an analogy to automobiles. And I come, I go to a automobile dealer, and 95 percent. I want to buy a environmentally sensitive small car. And 95% of the cars on the lot, though, are gas-guzzling, mm -hmm. humongous trucks and SUVs. I think I heard you say that 95% of the professors in the United States are mm -hmm. analytical Anglo-Americans. It strikes me that it's that I'm the buyer, I'm the purchaser, and the question is the supply. Yeah. Is it's it's very easy. The answer is very easy. Yeah. All of my friends who study this stuff are out of work. They don't, can't find jobs. Mm. You know, because guess what? <laughs> guess what? We don't need that kind of stuff. That's all old-fashioned yeah. stuff. That's all out of date. Mm. We need the latest thing off the which is our scientific picture. You know, the latest researcher who has answered the latest magazine. That's what we need. Well, that's not what philosophy is. Philosophy is perennial wisdom. It answers the big questions of human life, and the classical answers are not worse than the contemporary answers. They're, they they need to be updated. All the problem, the problem of Galileo, you know, the science. That's a that's a that's a new problem. That's not Aristotle's. Aristotle has some interesting things to say about it, but we need to up, update that. We need to, we have new questions after Frege. We have new questions in the last 15 years, of many of which I'm not aware of. You know, so we need we need to update it, but we need to have people who. Have, who are well grounded, who can, who, who are aware of this, these traditions, and who can defend them and, 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 and explain them and update them, and that they're not hard to find. They're out of work because we don't want them in the contemporary university. Trust me. Make a suggestion here. The last 25, 30 years, there have been a few um, good professors in America who formed their own safe spaces um, to train up philosophers to a high level. I'm very lucky. I study well with one of them, Eleanor Stump. Uh, you've got to find these people and ask their advice, and they will direct you to the people who are employable, mm. uh, but also will give you the wisdom uh, that universes really thrive on. David, can I ask, does this just infect philosophy departments, or does it spread to other disciplines? Are, are there manifestations of this uh, way of seeing the world that make things worse elsewhere? Who was it I was talking to on recently, you know? Does Derrida exist in English departments? I mean, does Foucault exist in? I know it was it was Noah. Where's Noah? I mean, you were the one, right? Who was saying, yeah. I've not, I've never read Foucault. We have a graduate course in Foucault right now, taught by one of my best friends in the philosophy department. But <coughs> Noah says she knows absolutely no philosophy. But of course, I have read a little bit of Foucault. I mean, he's fundamental in your discipline, right? You know, so so the so so the contemporary styles of philosophy have have in, in some ways, many of them the, of the continental fathers are more influential in literature and and in 
uh, social sciences than they are in, in certainly in contemporary analytic departments. It, uh, so this this uh, and that's the same kind of thing. For, for I I haven't really tried to tell with forgiveness the story of contemporary phenomenology. I I see it fundamentally as growing a reaction growing out of the modern tradition and a reaction to the modern, but very m many parts of it, of course, including parts of Husserl, parts of Husserl I think are really problematic, the idealism part, the idealist part, but the early Husserl is, is uh, in many ways, uh, I think, helpful for recovering Aristotle, John, as are elements of Hegel. John, at least with respect to Noah's point, and with respect to Foucault and politics, a colleague of mine, I don't think mistakenly, would relate the themes that you've been addressing, David, to Foucault and politics, suggesting that he feared that, you know, Thucydides' account of the Peloponnesian War talks about the way in which political relations are, are machinations are involving networks of power and power only. Um, uh, my colleague has referred to Foucault's political thought as Thucydides on steroids. So um, the question of, of, of norms, moral norms in political life goes the way of um, the Melian dialogue. Okay. Uh, you know, oh, by the way, that infiltrates every department meeting, too. <laughs> you know who the Foucaultians are by the night yeah. in your back. I mean, so, so that, that would be an application to political science or to political theory. Guys, regard, regardless of what the person. I'm sorry, that's right. You've been waiting a long time. Uh, so, uh, thank you for your, for your speech, David. I would like to actually to. Uh, ask your considerations about Kant, because it seems to me that Kant, uh, on the one hand, he believed in him. He he thought, well, we learn, we we get things from experiences, and that's what we get. But on the other hand, he also he believed in Newton, and he he thought that Newton did a great work, and yeah, things work. We have this whole structure, so it led him to build his theory to explain how we could uh, actually do things which work and have a common dialogue and so on. And this structure behind the mind, it seems to me that it led to many different branches, both of sciences and of philosophy, to try to find this holy grail. For example, if Marx, as he says that the structure, meaning the economic uh, 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 divisions of labor, they would influence the social structure. He is trying to say, well, that's the hidden formula which uh, uh, happens to explain everything. Mm -hmm. And then Freud comes and says, well, no, the, uh, it, it, it actually boils down to, to, to the heroes and to the relationship between the, the person and the, the families in the upbringing, and maybe the, the, the um, uh, sociologist will get Malinowski method and say, well, yeah, you know, there is nothing <coughs> but this uh, personal, personal social relations, and so there is no right, no wrong, and the chemist, the, 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 the chemist will say, no, I, actually we are just a bunch of molecules and nothing more than that. At the end of the day, each one of these views is trying to have this one united explanation of everything that will give the solution to everything. And that's... So notice that's, that, 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 that approach uh, resonates with, uh, with what Descartes was saying, and I think it is, it is fundamental unity with scientism, which is one method explains everything. One of the things that Aristotle lays down is every discipline has its own method. Yes, and, and, uh, and you know, then and as, as your call to the, as your call to the history of philosophy, I also understand that philosophy has a very big problem compared, for example, to uh, physics or to medicine, because in Physics, you go to the laboratory, although it would really help if you know the whole history of physics, so, you can do physics without doing that. So look, the, the, but the, philosophy distinction, you can. the distinction between philosophy and science is a 19th century distinction. <laughs> uh, and, and notice the word PhD, doctor of philosophy. Um, 
science is the greatest invention by philosophers ever. Let me repeat that. You know, I mean, science is incredible, right? Science is the greatest invention. But, but so, so what's left for philosophy is all the questions that are, aren't in our other disciplines in which you get a doctorate in philosophy. So that, that starts to look like, it looks as if philosophy is something completely useless, that, that no uniform method uh, can arrive at consistent results. And that is a problem for philosophy. That's why I describe lady philosophy is in rags. But if you look at the history of philosophy, the reasons for the, 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 uh, the revolutions in conceptual schemes, and, and I think that helps you understand the difficulty where the crisis we're in for reason generally, and why we need authorities, even though it sounds paradoxical, there are two revelations I want to insist on to this group, right? The revelation of, of God in scripture and you know, coming to human beings, so, but the revelation of God creating the natural <laughs> world which is intelligible. And that's philo philosophy includes science in this, I mean globally, we need reason. And the best account of all those questions that are left over when you have all the other methodologies and all the other disciplines that are invented by philosophers. And, and you still have these other sets of questions, the big global questions about the semantic triangle, and we need to give up the best account. I suggest to you, if, if you want a religious university, one that's complementary to religion. And we should favor the, the, the traditional uh, uh, proponents of uh, moderate realism, which I recommend, Avicenna, put him at the center. You know, and Maimonides, following Avicenna, on many, many points, is the fund of the proof of God's existence. Avicenna is proof. And, and Aquinas, Duns Scotus, if you really want to read through Duns Scotus. But, but you don't have to favor one person or one trait. We should learn from each other. It's beautiful. The others, you know, God creates this diversity of religions and, and approaches because human reason is big enough. We got, you know, one tradition won't get it all. Same here. We can read Arabic philosophy. We can read Jewish philosophy. We can read all kinds of insights in contemporary analytic philosophy, all kinds of insights in modern philosophy. I don't mean to denigrate those at all, but we need to have a, we need to have a big story so that we get our priorities right, and we need philosophical authorities. I think I think this is a good place for us to uh, yeah yeah this is a this is a speech, <laughs> not a not a lecture. And we can of course carry this on. We have a couple of minutes, and then we're going to uh, carry like really fast uh, breather, and then we're going to carry on with uh, Professor Kaprowski, right? You have next. Do you need? No. Okay.